Radio. How are we doing out there, everybody? My name is Tyler Bieber, the host of the CFL portion here on Rouge Radio, a division of Sports A Media. You know, in an eight and soon to be nine team league, news doesn't come by all too often, but when it does, it seems like it just flies at you. You step away for maybe two minutes to go and you know, do something else, and all of a sudden, boom, something big happens. And that was the case on Wednesday as the Winnipeg Blue Bombers fired head coach Tim Burke after one and a half seasons where he led them to just seven wins and a compiled record of 7-21. and 21. Now, personally speaking, and I'm sure the news hit most of you the same way, it's not surprising. It just isn't. I mean, you look at the overall situation in Winnipeg, they fired Joe Mack during the season. Garth Butchko is no longer with the team. Last season, Paul Apolise left. He was fired. You know, you can see it coming. And I don't think you can blame Tim Burke for the entire mess that is the Winnipeg Blue Bombers organization over the course of the past two seasons. But to me, he never truly stepped into the role and embraced it like a head coach should. Now, Tim Burke has all this kind of experience. He has a world and a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the game of football, especially, of course, on the defensive side of the football, where he was a defensive coordinator in four consecutive Grey Cup games. Um, but throughout the season, and especially after difficult losses, I, which, the, of course, there were certainly many of in Winnipeg, I think Tim Burke would do all he could to deflect the blame away from himself and put the spotlight on others. And I was in Winnipeg a couple times covering uh, a couple games this season. And, you know, even just listening to him talk, I, I felt like, you know, he did that. He, he tried to deflect the blame away and put the spotlight on others. And we all know the story behind Joe Mack and the difficult time the Blue Bombers had in recruiting players to the city based on various reasons imposed by Joe Mack. But at the same time, I think you have to be able to take ownership upon yourself and away from your players. And I feel like Tim Burke simply did not do that. You know, he might have done it a couple of times, but overall I think he would, you know, maybe it was even unintentionally that he was doing it. He didn't know what he was really saying, but he would throw players under the bus by saying things about, you know, how thin the roster is and the stuff that Joe Mack did. And, and one of the quotes that especially took me by surprise in was this, he said that he is doing the best that he can with what he has to work with. And that last comment, the one that I just mentioned there, that just can't happen in a professional environment. And it, I don't think it even matters if it's in the sports world or in your everyday office or any other work setting out there. You know, it just creates a bad mood that lingers over everyone, drags down morale, and I think you saw that a lot with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers over the course of the past two seasons where they missed the playoffs both times after getting to the Great Cup game in 2011. Now, it's my own personal philosophy, and it may be that of many others out there as well, but here's another issue I had with the way people would talk about Tim Burke, his label, what you would say about him. And this can go for either a current head coach or someone in the past that has head coaching experience and is a good coordinator. And that's what people were labeling Tim Burke as. While he was the head coach of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers for 28 games, people would never talk about how good of a head coach he is. You would talk about how good of a coordinator, how good of a defensive guy, a defensive coordinator Tim Burke is. And when you get a head coach and he's labeled as a good defensive coordinator, I don't think they're going to stick around for a lengthy period of time because what you're basically saying is that he's not a good head coach. And I think you saw it a lot of times if you read the media, if you read fan forums, various you know social media ways to read this kind of thing, 
you'll see people rave about how good of a defensive coordinator Tim Burke is and or was, and that's great. You know, he is a good defensive coordinator. I think so. I'm sure most of you think so, too. He took four defenses to four straight great cup games, winning two of them. You know, he has the experience. He can bring it with a great defensive philosophy. But there's one problem with that, and that is he was the head coach of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. He wasn't the defensive coordinator. He was when Paul Apolise was the head coach, and he was in the 2011 Grey Cup and early part of 2012. But for the past 28 games, he was the head coach. He had the responsibility for the whole team. And I think at the end of the day, and one of my good friends, Darren Bombing, TSN 1290, Blue Bombers Insider, mentioned this too, his thought process and his decision-making at times actually even most of the time, just wasn't where it needed to be to be a quality head coach. You know, like a guy like John Huffnagel, Scott Milanovic, you know, these guys who are continually winning, even Wally Buono when he was on the sidelines. Most of the time, Tim Burke just didn't make the right decision. And, I mean, you look back at other coaches who are who have been labeled as good coordinators and we'll go with a recent period here just because I mean you can expand on it so much but we'll go with a little bit of familiarity here and that's uh George Cortez right current Saskatchewan Rough Riders offensive coordinator great offensive philosophy I mean you saw what they did with Corey Sheets with Darian Durant earlier this season just a masterful performance from George Cortez as the offensive coordinator of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders he was a great cup champion with the Calgary Stampeders you know, he helped Henry Burris be the MVP. Or most outstanding player, whatever you prefer. But when he got on the sidelines to be the head coach of the Hamilton Tiger Cats, he lasted one season because he couldn't get it done. The other example here I have is Greg Marshall former Saskatchewan Rough Riders head coach and the current defensive coordinator of the Edmonton Eskimos. Nobody's going to deny that Greg Marshall is not a fantastic defensive guy. He's a defensive guru. He has been for years. But when he got the chance to step up and take on the lead role, he failed. He was fired early in that 2011 season by the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. And that kind of leads into my next point here as the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, you know, Ottawa Red Blacks, Edmonton Eskimos, possibly the Montreal Alouettes, they're all looking for a new head coach. And I think the mantra and the philosophy of teams is going to start to, you're going to start to see a little bit of a shift here. You know, in the past, you look for the guy who has lots of experience, the guy who's been around football for what seems like ever. You know, he knows how to get it done. But I think you're going to start to see a shift towards the youth. The younger guys. Corey Chamblin, Saskatchewan Rough Riders head coach. Scott Milanovic, current head coach of the Toronto Argonauts. Mike Benavides of the BC Lions. Even Kavis Reed was, is a young head coach, or was a young head coach with the Edmonton Eskimos. And here's why. Here's, here's my idea on why this happens. You have all these young, talented players. You know, some of them are just coming out of college. And they need a head coach they can relate to. A guy who's going to breathe fire into your lineup, into your roster. Get them pumped up. You know, Greg Marshall, for example, with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, he just didn't do it. He didn't know how to motivate these players. And they failed immensely because of it. As As much as you can say that a player is a player... And no matter how good he is, he can play with any head coach. That's simply not the case. It just doesn't happen like that. And there are numerous examples. You can you can pretty much pick out and point of an example in the past in the NFL, CFL, NHL, MLB. I mean, I don't care which league you look at. You'll find plenty of examples of it. But you get the young guy in there. He starts to jab his team up a little bit, get them fired up. You know, he's got a little bit of a, a flame, if you will, when he's, when he's speaking and when he's on the sidelines, you know, he has that personality. 
that's what you want in a head coach. And the older guys, as great, again, as great as they are with a football mind, that just rarely happens from them. And you look in the Hamilton Tiger Cats, Kent Austin, a fantastic head coach. One of the reasons, his personality. You know, he gets these guys to play. He knows what to do to motivate a roster. And some of these other guys, they, they simply don't. So that's about it for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Um, there's, there's speculation. Out there, and I'm going to call it speculation because the Saskatchewan Rough Riders have to allow permission for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers to speak to Kahari Jones about being the head coach. And there's a rumor that it will be Kahari Jones, but that can't be the case because the Saskatchewan Rough Riders said that they've never given permission to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers to speak to any of their guys. So if there's something out there that says Kahari Jones is going to be the next head coach of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, you label it as speculation, unless there's something fishy going on there, you know, tampering that deal. Um, there's all the situations about Wade Miller and Kahari Jones being great friends, you know, going back to their Blue Bomber days, um, all that kind of thing. But as it is right now, it's speculation. And just speculation. I, I've thought for the longest time now that Kahari Jones is going to be with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in some capacity next season just because he's a quarterback's coach with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, and I think he's ready to move up. And he was up with the Hamilton Tiger Cats in 2011 under Marcel Belfay. But I think he's ready to move back up to either the offensive coordinator role or, you know, I, I, I'm not quite sure if he's ready to be a head coach. But again, it's the younger guy, right? going to get that roster, that young talent that's in Winnipeg, going to get them to play. So we'll see what happens there with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers as we head towards the, the Grey Cup here. I don't think you're going to, you know, mainly just because Kari Jones could be the next head coach, that you're going to see anybody hired until probably late November or the first week of December. That seems to be the prime time to have a new head coach hired. Okay, so Speaking of the Great Cup there briefly, um, mentioned this in the past, going to mention again, great event coming up here uh, Friday, November 22nd in Regina. The first Canadian Football Hall of Fame Hall of Fame party. Tickets go for $100 plus taxes, includes food, drinks, which is an open bar. Going to be several legends in attendance there, which you can walk around and talk to. Don Narcisse, George Reed. Roger Aldeg, Bob Poley, Bobby Jurison, Damon Allen. You know, just a wealth of guys that you've seen in the past and Hall of Famers that are going to be at that party. Um, it's going to be a great time. Again, that's Friday, November 22nd. More details go to the Canadian Football Hall of Fame website. That's www.cfhof.ca. So be sure to check that out. Maybe we'll see you there. I'll be there, so maybe we'll see you there. Um, care if you're early. Um, I saw. <laughs> I was talking to one of my one of my friends, good friends, uh, about the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and BC Lions. I predicted the BC Lions to win the game, so I got a little bit of a ribbing from him. He is Dar. His name is Darcy. He runs Boston Pizza in the East End. So if you're in Regina or going to be in Regina for the Great Cup, please go there, support him. He's a good man. So I just wanted to get that out of the way, give him a little shout-out, you know, tell him I sent you. Maybe he'll give you some free beer or something like that. He should. I mean, giving him all the business, right? Anyways, past Sunday, division semifinals. Hamilton Tiger Cats, Saskatchewan Rough Riders, eking through to the division finals. Ticats beat the Montreal Alouettes 19-16, and the Rough Riders defeated the BC Lions 29-25. But we're going to start in the East, because it was the first game, so we'll go there. Um, just a weird game, eh? 2-0 Montreal led at the half. And a lot of it seemed to have an influence with the wind. Did you see the game? The wind? Sean White missed a 27-yard field goal short. That's how bad the wind was. He went to kick the ball. It got up, and it got so high 
and not even so high, just high enough that the wind just pulled it, and the wind took it down. Just a crazy circumstance for Sean White, and unfortunately for the Montreal Alouettes. But uh, I also picked Montreal in this game. Uh, here's why. I, I really like their defense. I thought their defense is probably the best group of defenders in the entire league. They play so well together. Chip Cox, defensive candidate in the East for most outstanding defensive player. I thought that their offense would be able to be consistent enough to get a win, and the defense would be able to hold the Tie Cats to you know 21 points or less, which they did. But again, the offense just didn't get it going. They weren't consistent enough, and I think that started with the quarterback, Troy Smith. And we've talked in the past about how good of a playmaker Troy Smith is. And he is a good playmaker. He has a strong arm. He can sling it. But I think his downfall is his inconsistency. You know, he's not going to be the guy to lead you down the field on a huge drive where he's going completion after completion after completion. He's going to be the guy who maybe gets one or two completions, then throws two or three incompletions, you know, maybe a bad throw here and there. So as good as he is a, as a playmaker, he lacks the ability to consistently hit his receivers. And at the end of the day for the Montreal Alouettes, that was their downfall because they desperately need a drive. But it's not going to come unless you just hand the football off to Tyrell Sutton. And at that point in the game, you got to run. you you got to pass the football because if you run, you're running all this time off the clock and you're going to run out of time. Now, they only needed a field goal to tie it up to send it to overtime. So fortunately for them, they were able to do that. But overall, they just couldn't push the pace down the field in a in a good way to be able to put up points on the Hamilton Tiger Cats. And Tyrell Sutton had 21 carries for 142 yards in the game. But again, I think it comes back to the quarterback. And they turned the ball over four, four times. There was two that while it wasn't a whole lot of damage done against the Montreal Alouettes, they came early in the second half. Arlan Bruce, Bo Bowling. The Bo Bowling one especially was critical because he had, he had a big gain. I think it was about 26-yard gain or something like that, and then he fumbled the football and just killed the momentum. And that's partially why I don't think the Montreal Alouettes were able to get you know, a drive together either. And that goes back to what we were just, what I was just talking about, the inconsistency. You know, they get a big play, then they do something bad, like fumble the football. And that seemed to be the biggest reason why they didn't have more wins during the regular season. And, I mean, you can say that really about anybody, but I think it's especially true about the Montreal Alouettes because that defense is so good. But they just couldn't put it together on offense. And then you look at the Hamilton Tiger Cats in this game, they pretty much went with the same strategy that they did in beating the Montreal Alouettes in the regular season. And that was use the backup quarterback. In this case, it was Dan Lefevre. In the last regular season game, it was Jeremiah Masoli. And again, something else we talked about in the past, right? The backup quarterback. Using him, his youth, his younger, quicker legs to try and beat the defense. Henry Burris, again, he's not going to be that guy anymore to, to be able to run the football and beat a defense. You know, five years ago, that was him. When he was a great cup champion, that's who Henry Burris was. But now you rely on his arm strength and his ability to throw the football. And that's about it. You know? And whether at the end of the day, on Sunday, if that costs them a chance at the great cup, who knows? You know, but Dan Lefevre, he stepped in, he performed well, he got the game winning touchdown in overtime, a two yard score after an eleven yard gain to set that up. But again, they respected the number one ranked rush defense that is the Montreal Alouettes. Two carries for CJ Gable again. That was fourteen carries total in four games against the Montreal Alouettes. Just crazy respect for that defense. Insane almost. They're going to have to use C.J. Gable on Sunday against the Toronto Argonauts. And they may be able to use him well. 
because in the regular season, C.J. Gable had a ton of success against the Toronto Argonauts. He had two touchdowns in week one, even though he dropped a potential game-winning touchdown pass. And in the other two games, I believe he ran over or at least near 100 yards in both of those contests. Both Hamilton Tiger Cat victories. And I've been going back and forth about this game between the Tiger Cats and the Argos, and I have yet to pick a winner. Because I think one team can attack the other here, and then the, the, on the flip side, the other team can attack them in this part. You know, And I'm, I'm speaking of Ricky Ray. I think he'd be able to make the throws that Troy Smith can't, could not against the Tiger Cats defense. And I think partially that's why the Toronto Argonauts are going to win this football game. They're missing Chad Cackert, though. And their defense, while they do boast some theory, are a little bit lackadaisical, I think. And then on the flip side, why I think the Hamilton Tiger Cats could win this game is they know how to beat Toronto. They did it twice in the regular season, even though Ricky Ray missed one of those games. Ricky Ray still started that, what I believe it was the second game in their home and home, and they beat him. Now, of course, they're going on the road, but Kent Austin knows how to win on the road. You look back to 2007, they beat the BC Lions in the West Division, West Division Final when he was the head coach of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. He knows what to do. He knows the exact kind of situation that you need to have to win this football game on Sunday. Henry Burris, the veteran quarterback, he knows too. Andy Fantuz was the star receiver for those Saskatchewan Rough Riders in 2007. They have the experience to get it done. But then you look at the Toronto Argonauts. They're the defending Grey Cup champions. Very few players were not on the Argos last year. So I think it's going to be a fantastic game. Uh, I've yet to decide on the winner, like I said. So, you know, what happens, who knows. But it's going to be a fantastic game, especially looking forward to that one. And so we flip off over to the West side the west division now and for 45 minutes the bc lions were looking like the team that had the right combination of things on offense you know they had everything going for them with andrew harris with stefan logan they created the perfect run game the misdirection i could not believe that that was a jacques chaplin design game plan when have you ever seen that kind of innovation from Jacques Chaptelin? Maybe if they had more, they wouldn't have needed to go on the road in the playoffs. They probably would have had another win or two, and it would have been enough to surpass the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and host them in the West Division semifinal, and that may have made all the difference. But at the end of the day, they had to go on the road, and they lost. Um, Travis Lule. He performed well, uh, didn't throw any touchdown passes. The only touchdowns that they had were from Stefan Logan and Thomas DeMarco on the ground. DeMarco having a one-yard touchdown. But they just fell apart in the fourth quarter. Just unbelievable. And when you look at the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, the only reason that they're going on to Calgary no matter how well the defense played in the fourth quarter, limiting the BC Lions to just three possessions, the only reason they're going to Calgary is number four, the quarterback, Darian Durant. And as big as his detractors have been all season, he sure shut them up, didn't he? You know, my thoughts on Darian Durant are, I, I, think, I think he's a good leader. And... You know, when, when people ask me my opinion on Darian Durant, here's what I usually say. You know, they talk about Drew Willey and how Darian Durant sometimes throws a costly interception, as quarterbacks do. But what I tell him is, you know, he, he's the best you have. So if you think somebody's better, he's the best you have. Support him, you know. He's shown what he can do under George Pez. He's shown that he can protect the football. And I think he's proven himself time and time again, no matter what you say about him, that's a top quarterback in the Canadian football league. I mean, you'd probably still take Ricky Ray. 
But you could certainly make a case for Darian Durant to be one of the top guys that you're going to pick. You're starting out a new franchise. And I what, despite the stats, here with the stats, 19-23 for 270 yards and two touchdowns. He had six carries for 97 yards. But here's what impressed me the most about Darian Durant. And something that he may not have done in the past a whole lot, or very well. Protecting the football. You saw late in the first half after Corey Sheets had a 61-yard screen play. So around the four-yard line or somewhere in there. Darian Durant was dropped past. They were looking to get in a quick score because they only had seconds left on the clock. And it's the football. He didn't have anybody else. So instead of throwing the football, trying to force it into a receiver, you know, maybe kicked off, he ate the ball. He, he slid down. He got a penalty drawn because of it. He kicked the field goal. They were down one point. That was the half. Great decision from Darian Durant not to throw a football or force one in and lose points. But in the fourth quarter especially, he converted three second down plays, 35 yards, 28 yards. I think the other one was 13 yards, using his legs. Darian Durant was never going to throw the football unless he had somebody open. And that comes back to decision-making. And he was so good making decisions in this football game. And the BC Lions just couldn't stop them on second down in the fourth quarter. The Riders converted seven second down plays out of nine attempts in the final quarter. That is ridiculous for anybody to give up and ridiculous for anybody to get because the defense should just not be giving that up. And it shouldn't be that easy for an offense, but it was for Darian Durant because... They weren't even looking at Darian Durant. Darian Durant hasn't been the guy who's going to take off and run the football in the past few years. A couple of years ago, that was him. You know, when they 2009, especially 2010, when they were in the Great Cup, that's who he was. That was part of his game. More recently, though, the past you know 2011, 2012, and this season, he hadn't done a whole lot of that. But he knew what to do when the time came, and he got it done. And that comes back to his experience as a Grey Cup quarterback who made two appearances in 2009 and 2010. And if you get this kind of decision-making from Darian Durant on Sunday against the Calgary Stampeders, I guarantee you that it's going to come down to the end. They may not win the game still because Calgary, you know, we talked about it time and time again how good they can be. But I guarantee you, if Darian Durant plays as well as he did against BC, that this is going to be one heck of a football game. And it's going to come right down to it. And why wouldn't you think that? I, I believe Darian Durant's playoff record against West Division opponents is 4-1. and one. He's lost one game. That was last year. The only reason they lost that game is because Drew Tate and one of the receivers, I can't for the life of me recall who it was, made a fantastic play to beat the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. That was the only reason Darian Durant has a loss. It wasn't on him. You know, It was just an unfortunate situation on defense that happened. But when the time comes, Darian Durant knows what to do. And if you're a Saskatchewan Rough Rider fan, you have got to love that. Got to love his decision-making process right now. May not have been the best, you know, through the middle part of the season, heading towards the end. But in the playoffs, it's Darian Durant time, and he knows what to do. So coming up here against the Calgary Stampede is going to be another fantastic game. Um... I still think the Calgary Stampeders might win. They were my pick to go to the Great Cup for the longest time, but you know, I, I was impressed with what I saw with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders on Sunday. I'm not going to make a prediction in the game just yet. You'll have to stay tuned. Check out Twitter for that. But uh, three games left in the 2013 Canadian Football League season. Time flies, doesn't it? Three games. It's Grey Cup week next week. What? Where does the time go? I don't know. If you have any answers as to where the time goes, please let me know. Anyways, coming up here in a couple minutes, the gentleman from Sports A is going to take you through what's going on in the CIS. Coming up here, the national semifinals. It's going to be huge. Calgary Dinos, Western Mustangs, Mitchell Bull, Laval Rouge Or, Mount 
Allison Mounties. How about that? Mount Allison playing in the national semifinal. Good for them. New Tech Bowl, that one. The winners meet for the Vanier Cup. How about this, though? This past Sunday in Regina, along with the West Division semifinal, the Canadian Bowl, the Regina Thunder taking on the powerhouse out of the BC Football Conference, the Vancouver Island Raiders, and for the first time, the Regina Thunder are your national champions. So a huge shout-out to Scott McCauley and all the great people in that Regina Thunder organization. A long time coming, a lot of hard work. But as the saying goes, hard work pays off. And it certainly did for the Regina Thunder, winning their first-ever Canadian Junior Football League National Championship. So that's going to do it for me here. On the CFL portion of things, I'm going to hand the football off to Jane Katsuris of Sports A. I'm going to be talking with Zachary Miller as usual. And sitting out tonight is Patrick Yen, but jumping into the fold is Nails Docker. They're going to be breaking it down as we head towards the national semifinals last week where the conference championships. They'll talk about that. Of course, they'll have come on, man. Got to love that segment. So here we go. That's it for me. My name is Tyler Griff, of course, the host of the CFL portion here on Rouge Radio. Hope you enjoyed tonight's show. Uh, we'll talk to you next week. Grey Cup Week. I hope you're as excited as I am. Thanks for listening to Rouge Radio. <laughs> Welcome to the weekly CIS Football Roundup here on Rouge Radio, presented by Sports A. This week we'll be analyzing all of the playoff action from this past weekend, as well as looking forward to the UTEC and the Mitchell Bowl. My name is James Katsuris, and as always, I'll be your host for this episode. And joining me is Sports A Vice President and former receiver for the McGill Redmen, Zachary Miller, uh, our Sports A, uh, or who is our Sports A VP, sorry, and uh, replacing Patrick Yan on today's show is Top Prospects Operations Manager and fellow McGill Varsity alumnus, Niels Takar. Nice to have you on the show, Niels. Thank you very much, James. Nice to be here. All right, so uh, in this episode, uh, we're going to do a quick rundown of our predictions for the CIS Awards. We'll be reviewing the CIS Conference Finals from last weekend, including Mount Allison's, uh, I guess you could call it upset victory over St. Mary's, although some might not see it that way. The national semifinal games for this coming weekend, of course, the UTEC Bowl and the Mitchell Bowl, and an in-depth discussion on the nominees for the Heck Crichton Award. And finally, we'll, we'll end it with, uh, as always, with our segment, Come On Man. So we'll kick off the show by discussing our predictions for the playoff. Well, before we get to that, actually, we'll, we'll do, uh, we're going to do something a little different because there has been a little controversy uh, not, not so much controversy, but a little discussion on the Heck Crichton and what it means. So uh, in light of that, we're going to go through all the awards, and we're going to pick, uh, just quickly, we're going to do a quick rundown of who our favorites are or who we predict to win them. So we'll start with the Heck Crichton. Uh, I'll go over to you, Niels. Who do you have winning this? i got to go with Will Finch, Jordan Heather, and close second. Zach? Uh, for me, it's going to have to be uh, either Finch or Timmis, but I'm going to have to go with Timmis. I like to see a running back take it this year. I'm going to go off the wall here. Not necessarily off the wall, but I'm going to go with Jordan Heather what he meant to the Bishop Skaters. President's Trophy, who you got, Niels? Antoine no, has to be the top defensive player on the second best, second top defensive team in the country. Zach? I'm going to have to agree with Niels there. Uh, Antoine Pruneau, uh core of the Montreal defense, and they're, they produced all year. To me, it has to be Pavel Kruba of Western. Uh, he dominated for one of the most overlooked defensive teams in the country, and I know playoffs aren't, shouldn't be taken into this, but he absolutely dominated the Queens Gales in last week's uh, <laughs> Yates Cup matchup. J.P. Metris uh, Trophy, outstanding down lineman. Who you got, Niels? No question. McGill alum here. we got to go with Laurent Duvernay-Tardif. Best offensive tackle in the country. NFL prospect. Got to be him. I'm going to have to agree with Niels. I think it's an unanimous decision. There are some great players on that list, but Laurent is just in his league of his own, getting NFL looks. All Academic, all Canadian. This guy is the best. I don't know how anybody could pick against Ettore Latanzio of Ottawa, tied for the CIS lead in sacks. His team was 2-6 and six in year 1, 5-3 and three this year, and he was just a terror on the line. I mean, he was one of the most uh, dominant defensive tackles in the entire country all year long. 
Next, Peter Gorman Trophy, Rookie of the Year. I'll go with Adam Lawson, defensive tackle for Acadia. Um, well, Rookie of the Year, I'm going to go uh, 100% for me. It's Vandervoort, Vert, sorry, of uh, McMaster. He's the only one that really uh, put up any stats uh, that were contributing in a in significant way to his team. Uh, he was a top receiver in the OUA, and he deserves it 100%. I like Rashawn Simonese of Calgary because he was uh, very uh, – I mean, he, he was a multifaceted threat. He was very versatile, sorry, because he also did, uh, you know, in the return game. But you got to go with Andy Vandervoort. Eight touchdowns uh, as a rookie. That, I mean, he just blew everybody else away. So, for me, it's Vandervoort of McMaster as well. The Russ Jackson Award, I mean, we can just uh, pick any of these guys, really. We're not going to pick a winner out of all of them because all their contributions we commend. And, uh, you know, they, they just epitomize what Canadian football is all about. So, we'll move on to the Frank Tindall Trophy. Finally, Coach of the Year, who you got? I got to go Greg Marshall, <clears throat> best team in the country, came back last year, good team this year, amazing team, go Greg, Greg Marshall. Uh, for me, it's going to be Kevin McKee from Bishops, he turned his team around, who had an 0-8 season last year, obviously they played some ineligible players, but he finished 6-2 and this year, the team, their offense was, you know, revamped, and uh, they finished second in the RSEQ. For me, it's easy. Blake Nill, uh, eight and zero, first time in program's history. After losing Stephen Lumbalo, Mike Edom, Jordan Verdone, uh, Lyndon Gaydosh, and then their star quarterback Eric Dolesky gets injured first game of the year. Are you kidding me? He gets it, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so that wraps up that quick segment. So we'll move on to uh, the playoff action. Of course, we'll first start off with our predictions uh, from last week. We all went three and one. Uh, if Pat was here, I would have hazed him on picking Queens, being the only one picking Queens, because uh, obviously that didn't exactly go according to plan for him. I was incorrect on St. Mary's. I think that's a little more defensible. And then Zach, of course, got Montreal wrong. Uh, he seems to enjoy picking against Laval. Uh, do you have an explanation for that one, Zach? Having played against Laval, I've seen uh, them at a high, you know, high caliber, and I just don't think they were there this year. I thought Montreal could compete, which they did, and it was Montreal's game to lose, and they lost. So. Not much more to say. Okay, so let's jump right into this. We're going to start off with last week's AUS championship game. Mount Allison, Mounties, pull off a last-second field goal to win the game against St. Mary's Husk, uh, Huskies 27 to uh, sorry, 20 to 17. Uh, did anything surprise you about that game, Niels, or is that how you expected it to go? It is pretty much how I expected. It came down <clears throat> to the last minute. Not much offensive play. I think there was only one offensive touchdown for uh, Mount Allison. But they've proven all year that they can play against these top guys in the AUS, whether you can call them top guns or not, really. They beat Acadia twice, now they beat St. Mary's. They know how to win. They can pull it off. Brandon Lay, not the best game. But, again, somehow they managed a way to win, and that's all that matters in the end. Yeah, when you look at it, for me, I I wouldn't really call it an upset. Um, They beat St. Mary's twice this year, did it for a third time at St. Mary's house. Um, and, you know, it's just St. Mary's lack of consistency on offense. You know it's going to bite them uh, in the rear at some point. And uh, Jordan Battelle, 133 yards rushing. He's been doing it week after week. Um, and they did make a big stop defensively in the, at the end of the game to get the ball back and kick that field goal for the win. So, you know, all for the Mounties there. Congrats. I feel bad for consistently picking against the Mounties. I have to obviously pick against again uh, this coming week. But you know what? Credit to them. Uh, they had a fantastic season, and uh, the coaches did a really great job with that team, and I'm happy for them. We'll move on to the RSEQ now, the Dunsmore Cup, Montreal 11, Laval 14. In their first game, it was close. The second game, it was close all game until Laval pulled away late. We wanted to see a close game at uh, Tele Stadium, uh, and Montreal certainly delivered, and they just weren't able to get it done. Uh, what stood out to you from that matchup, uh, Niels? Um, well, what really stood out was how Montreal really kept in the game the whole time. I, I pred- like I, I wanted that to happen. It did happen, but it kind of summed up their whole season. They were just they pulled up just short. At the start of the season, it was the, very promising. They had so much potential. They still, oh, they still have the potential. Sine got hurt. The whole season kind of took a downward spiral. Spiral, but they still managed to go to the Dunsmore Cup. Um, and then they just couldn't pull through. Typical Montreal fashion, you kind of hate to say it, but it was pretty typical. Couldn't bowl through. They were tight the whole game. They were up at the start. And then Laval, you, you cannot make mistakes against this Laval team. They might not have the best game of their season, but they won't make mistakes. If you make mistakes, you're going to lose. Montreal paid the price. 
And in fairness to you, Zach, uh, uh, you had the stones to pick against Laval at Tall Stadium, and you were almost right. You know what I mean? Montreal had a chance to win it late, and it just didn't go their way. Yeah, Laval hasn't lost at TELUS in years, since 2004. I think they had like a 67-game win streak right now or something ridiculous like that. Um, but when you look at it, they, Montreal helped Laval to no touchdowns that game. Laval did not score a touchdown. They managed 450 yards of offense. They turned over the ball three times, two picks from Skinner, one fumble from Burasa. But, you know, I commend Montreal for playing. Their defense kept them in an all-game. Um, it's just, you know, when Laval can win a game without scoring a touchdown, that's, that's just scary stuff. And look out, Mount A, that's all i got to say. So here's my question to you guys, uh, anticipating this uh, UTEC Bowl matchup. Will Jordan Botel have to rush for 400 yards for the Mounties to have a chance to win against Laval? He'll have to run for 500. But there's there's 0% chance any of that's going to happen. It's going to be an annihilation. Zach, can you? is there any scenario where you can conceive the Mounties pulling off the offset? I mean, they are playing at home. They are, but let's look at home field advantage for Mount A. If everyone in their school showed up to that game, it would be a smaller crowd than Laval is used to at home. Like, this is that plays no effect into how Laval is going to play. Maybe the grass field will make a few Laval players slip up here and there, um, but that will not be Laval. Laval is just on a different level. Um, the Mounties came and played McGill earlier in the season, lost 48 to 17. Uh, just there's just no way here to really argue for Mount A, and um, it's it sucks, but it's just going to be Laval in the Vanier Cup once again. I do want to say that like. I think this is the best the Mount Allison that, that they've looked in recent years since they've kind of had no identity since they lost Kelly Hughes. I think it was 2009. Gary Ross is gone. They really they haven't had a go-to player. I think the program could be turning around. I have some buddies out there playing. They all say it's like looking really bright. I'm really happy, but against Laval right now, it's going to be what what movie was it? War of the Worlds, where they say this isn't a war. This is going to be an extermination. That's it's what it's going to be. It could be in the 70s. The only thing that Mount Alfred has going for them is that they're at home playing on a grass field, which I guess you can say uh, is a disadvantage for Laval. But in all honesty, this is going to be – I feel bad for Mount Alfred. And, uh, you know, credit to them. As I said before, they made great strides, both hell, all Canadian last year. And, you know, they had another great running back, uh, you know, over a decade ago in LaPointe. So maybe he can uh, mirror his career and uh, do big things for them as well. So without further ado, we'll move on to the Hardy Cup in the Canada West. Calgary defeats Manitoba 43-28. It wasn't quite the game we were expecting, but of course uh, Manitoba lost Coombs on the first drive of the game, which probably changed things. Well, which definitely changed things for them. So what do you guys make of the game? Well, like you said, Coombs got hurt on the first drive, which you know essentially made Manitoba's offense one-dimensional. The backup running back did come in and play. He played well, but... Um, you know, Jordan Yan, shout out to him. He put the team on his back. Uh, he played a great game. He had, uh, he had a, a great game passing the ball, four touchdowns, and he also ran the ball really well with a 60-yard rush. Um, but, once again, Mercer Timmons stole the show, 297 yards, 279 yards, sorry, and two touchdowns, setting a conference playoff record. That is just rig- ridiculous. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I don't know what it is in the water out there, but this year the running backs have been absolutely killing it at West. Um, I thought Manitoba would put up a, well, losing the running backs so really, <clears throat> was absolutely a dagger for them. The Ants played well to keep it in the game. But I didn't think Calgary was as dominant this year as they had, had been in the past. They lost so many players last year to the draft. But I think the experience of being in a big game, uh, like it, that really played in their favor. They I mean, in the end, they dominated this game. I didn't think it would be that much uh, of a one-sided game. All the credit goes out to Blake Neal and the Calgary Dinos. When, of course, uh, Coombs, two-time All-Canadian, losing him is no small thing. So, you know, unfortunate for the Bisons, they had a great season, but Calgary's quest for an undefeated season uh, trudges on. So uh, we'll move on to the OUA now. We were anticipating a big matchup between Western and Queens. They faced once before this year. Uh, at TD Stadium, and Queens had a few untimely turnovers that ultimately cost them. So we were hoping for a big, epic matchup like the 2009 final between uh, Folds' Western and uh, Brannigan's uh, Queens, but it didn't exactly go that way, did it, guys? No, not at all. Last time, uh, Queens could argue that they had some players hurt 
Western was playing at full throttle. This time, I'd say it was kind of reverse. San, G- San Vito was out. Um, Har- Haru stepped in, obviously. He was a bit hurt last week. Stepped up, played a huge game. I don't know what it is with the offensive linemen, but these guys, they get five yards every rush. They, they literally can rush the ball without any, like, real opposition. Will Finch, again, looked great. Western, their only, I, I think, their only big matchup this year will be against Laval to see how that offense can really uh, show up against the best defense in the country. Uh, yeah, like like uh, Neil said, the rushing game for Western is just next level with that offensive line. But, you know, I was close, close to picking Queens, and, you know, I'm glad I didn't. Um, they had the tools to, to succeed, but obviously they can't find a way, way to get yards or to get touchdowns to get that Mustang defense. Um, when you look at it, Western is just an all-around better team, plain and simple. Um, there was really no battle of the OUA here. It was a little more hyped up to, you know, I think play into what people really wanted. But Queens was just no match for, for Western in the end. And unfortunately, Pat doesn't have the luxury of saying he almost didn't pick against uh, Western because he went with Queens ultimately. Uh, look, when I look at this game, uh, we, we, knew, we know what Will Finch brings to the table. Uh, we know what Anna Carew brings to the table. One of the best running backs in the country. He was a backup because there was, you know, last year's leading rusher. But now that Matt, the sample, Uren, you know, comes in, he's healthy now, and now he has a big game. I mean, look at all these weapons at his disposal. And Will Finch is a master. You know what I mean? Like, he orchestrates the offense. If he has these guys, the O-line gives them all day. Their defense, Bill Nainsworth and Ricky Osi on the outside. Daryl Watt all can be in the middle. Their top linebacker. I mean, they didn't even play with Bo Landry. They sat Bo Landry because he had a sore hammy, and they wanted to rest him for the Hardy Cup. They had him dressed just in case they needed him to go in the game, but obviously they never did because they dominated throughout. So you have Kruba in there, who's probably the top linebacker in the country this year, a stud group of safeties, right? We were expecting Queens to have, uh, you know, because they had the three OUA first-team All-Stars, uh, the defensive backs, but it was Western who was wreaking havoc. So this game didn't go at all as those who would have hoped for a big game to go. I think Western proved their dominance this year, and Queens ended up, uh, of course, not getting it done. So now what we have to look forward to, of course, is a very intriguing national semifinal between two undefeateds. This is what we all want to see right now at this point. Uh, Western and Calgary, two high-scoring teams, two teams that have heck quite nominees with very, very real, you know, chances of winning the award. This is pretty much a dream matchup. Uh, guys, walk me through it. For me, you know, I'm very excited for this game. Uh, you look at Calgary and you look at Western, they just, uh, yeah, like you said, they're both undefeated and they just dominated all year. Um, Mercer Timmis, if he can replicate the damage he's done against the Canada West, against Western, um, I think all oh, right, you can say he's the real deal. Um, he's been running all over Canada West defenses. If he can do that against that Western defense, I will be blown away. But look for him, you know, to battle for all those yards. He's a talented back. He's young, just like Finch is, though, too, right? He's young. He's, uh, he's been dominating OUA secondaries all year in the air and on the ground. But, um, you know, I think Western has the disadvantage to traveling. They're traveling out to, to Calgary, obviously. But it's going to be a great game, a tough pick. Uh, I think I'll have to go with Western. Um, on this one, Calgary is a young team, um, but Western's just been way too much of a high-powered offense this year. So both teams are tied for the most rushing touchdowns in the country. You think of Western as a really pass-heavy team. Uh, they're actually completely dynamic, both passing and running. Calgary, passing is okay. They really, really depend on Mercer Timmis, and I'm not sure if his success this year is a product of Calgary's dominance running, or it's just that the fact they're out west. There's been so many good running backs out west. Is it the fact that the defenses aren't so prepared, or aren't, that the D lines aren't big enough out west? I think they could be in for a big surprise when they play Western. That being said, like Zach said, Western is going on the road all the way out to Calgary. That's far. There's a lot of uh, travel time there. It might snow. Will Finch Western has not played in that kind of conditions. They probably won't be ready for it. Calgary has done that. Numerous times in the past, I think it could potentially be a blowout for Western, but that's a massive bias for me, seeing as I haven't seen that many games out West. I'm really judging them um, kind of almost based on the past performance, whereas I've seen almost every Western game this year. I don't see how Western loses. I don't see how they lose to anyone but Laval, but it's going to be a great game to see. We have the top scoring team in the country in Western. We have the third highest scoring team in the country in Calgary. Uh, what it comes down to, as far as I'm concerned, is how will Kruba and Landry be able to contain 
uh, Mercer Timmis, and how will Spolatini and Dr. Kasama be able to contain Yannick Haru? I think shutting down the other team's running game is going to be imperative. Both teams have very strong D-lines. Long Lay is a stud at Calgary, I already mentioned who Western has. Uh, teams that, honestly, they don't get the credit that they deserve for defense because of how good their offenses are. But for the, the points that you just made about the weather and about Western having to travel, and, of course, Timmis is an X-factor this year. And big players, you know, they, have their, they save their best performances for these big games, as you saw last week against Manitoba. So having said that, anything can happen. I do have to go with Western, though. I feel like their offense is so strong, and I feel like their defense is just as special this year. So I would go with the Mustangs in this one, but not with a whole deal of confidence. What, what year is Mercer Timmison? Only a second. So we have Will Finch, Janet Carew, and Mercer Timmis all in the second year who are the absolute studs of CIS this year. This, this game is coming down to second-year players. Don't forget George Johnson, also a second-year player who's a factor at the receiver, right, too? And it's just it's a great game to watch. These are all players that are going to be in the league for a while. Who knows, maybe these two teams match up again next year, right? So back on that note, how did Queens not show up? They, they were full of fourth-year, fifth-year players. They got burnt by... Uh, Second-year players. It's a great point. Great point, Neil. Yeah, it is a good point. So uh, I guess, you know, this is the time of year that we love because uh, the big players step up for the big occasions. So having said that, uh, we're going to move on to our next segment here. And there, there, there has been a little bit of discussion. Uh, there's a lot more intrigue surrounding the heck Crichton this year because, I mean, there are legitimately three guys who you could make just as strong a case for winning the award. Usually there's, you know, one guy. It's clear-cut, you know. It's that Kyle Quinlan. He has to get it. Or it's Jesse Lumsden. He has to get it. But this year, it's not only two guys. It's three guys with Jimmy. I mean, I love Jordan Botel. Jordan Botel carried the Mountie on his back. But at the end of the day, his numbers pale in comparison to Timmis's. And it would be, you know, a travesty to give it to him ahead of him if you were going to give it to a running back, which it doesn't get given to a lot anyways. But we're going to dive into the Heck Crichton conversation because there are a lot of people in the Jordan Heather camp uh, because of what he did for a team who's, you know, ostensibly worse. There are a lot of people in the Will Finch camp, and, of course, there are people in the Timmis camp. So uh, what camp are you guys in as far as this is concerned? Uh, well, for me, I think right now, like, I just look at Mercer Timmis and what he's been able to do. Uh, he had 18 rushing touchdowns this season, broke conference records. He had over 1,000 yards rushing. Um, you don't see that very often, you know. I haven't seen that in years. Uh, there was one rushing, running back last year with over 1,000 yards. Did he have close to 18 touchdowns? No. Um, but when you look at it, uh, Jordan Heather, you can make the case for him. He made an impact on a team that doesn't usually do as well. But when you look at it, the award is not given to the most valuable player. And I think that would, in that case, Jordan Heather would be uh, the winner. When it's given to the most outstanding player, I think it comes down to Timmis or Finch, in my opinion. It's, it's very interesting you should say that, Zach. Can you please elaborate on that point? Because I agree with you wholeheartedly. MVP would mean the player that is most valuable to his team. Uh, so you make the argument based on if you take that player away from his team, would they still be dominant? And in that case, then I think Finch, I think the Mustangs are still a strong team. Calgary is still a strong team. Obviously, Bishops is not a strong team. But as you said, it is most outstanding player, just like it is in the CFL. So it is the best player in Canadian university football. So th- should that factor into it more? And when I look at outstanding, you know, obviously Jordan Heather broke a CS passing record for uh, yards passing the season. Um, but Will Finch broke it the week before, and it's been broken, you know, maybe every other year going back. Um, so it's impressive. I'm not going to take anything away from Jordan uh, Hazard. Um, but when you look at all the stats, he's threw 55 or 56 more passes than Finch did. Finch's completion uh, rate was almost 10% higher than Heather's. And also Finch's running game is just uh, eclipses Jordan Heather's running game, if you put it at that. Over 300 yards rushing and five touchdowns, uh, that's a special player. Um, so if I was going to give it to a quarterback, it would have to be Finch in this case. But I really like what Mercer Timmis did this year, and I think it's time for a little change up and a running back gets it. I like your ideas about the running backs. I just don't see it happening. This, this trophy has been won by a quarterback for the past, I don't know, five or six years. To be a running back to win this award, you have to absolutely dominate, which you could argue that Mercer Timmis did. Mercer Timmis did. But I think it's going to come down to two quarterbacks. as a quarterback heavy league. So then it's Will Finch, Jordan Heather. Jordan Heather broke the record for the most uh, passing yards all time in a season this year. I don't know how you can't give it to that guy. And then I get what you're saying about the most valuable player, most outstanding player. 
Uh, but at the same time, then you could give that year that Peyton Manning lost was hurt and Indianapolis went like one of fifteen. Would you give that to Peyton Manning the year he didn't even play? He should have been the most valuable player. So I don't really see that distinction so much being that valid. So I would argue that Jordan Heather should get it. He's a fourth year player, so that's another factor that's probably not supposed to count. It's not supposed to come into play, but for the voting it most certainly will. But then going in Will Finch's favor. Uh, Jordan Heather was knocked out of the playoffs really early, so he's less fresh in her mind. If Will Finch goes to the Vanier Cup, he's going to be right there. So who do I think should get it and who I think will get it are two different things. I think Will Finch should get it, or I think Will Finch will get it. I think Jordan Heather should get it. See, I'm, I'm on the opposite with that. I think that uh, Jordan Heather is going to get it. I, I feel like Will Finch should get it, but I think Jordan Heather is going to get it, and that's why I picked him. And – I, I think Finch should get it, not because not to take anything away from Heather did. Uh, his, even if the numbers weren't as good, I don't think it has to do necessarily with the OUA having more bottom feeder teams. I don't, I don't like that argument very much. I think it, uh, you, you gotta take the numbers away from it at the end of the day. You know, you, you use the eye test. And Jordan Heather, forget about the fact that he was valuable just because his team wasn't as good as around him. I mean, he did have some weapons. He had Fox, right? But it just, I mean, he just performed. And, and, and this is a regular season award, so you can't take the playoffs into account. And he was every bit as good as uh, every player, any other player in the country. I think he will get. I think we'll give it to him because he's an older player as well. But I think Finch deserves it. I think Finch. If you put every, if you put both of them on the same team, I think Finch has better numbers. I think Finch is better. I think he's the more talented player. I think uh, if you take his rushing totals into account, 200 more rushing yards, uh, five rushing touchdowns, right? And I haven't even said anything about Timmis yet, who, uh, I mean, what a phenomenal year. He had 10 more rushing touchdowns than anyone else, led the, the country in rushing. So, I mean, it's just, you can go anyway with this. There's no wrong answer. But then again, you give Jordan Heather, Yannick Haru, and San Vito. What do you get in Bishops? Going against, and also then you put Will Finch going against Laval, going against Montreal. Was it Montreal twice, Laval once, whatever it was, Sherbrooke a couple times. You can make an argument both ways. Great point, and I agree with you, and that's why I think Heather will get it. And, you know, it, it, I won't be upset about it. I, I think Finch was the better player that you out of anyone, but I think uh, Heather will get it. So we're going to have to jump into our final segment of Come On, Man, and we're going to have to go quick because we're running out of time. So, guys, I'm going to ask that you keep this to a minute or shorter. We'll start off with Zach. Who do you got for Come On, Man? Uh, my Come On, Man this week is going to be the AUS QB All-Star Selection. How could you even pick a QB out ease, honestly? Um, it's sad to say, but Brandon Lay, who got it, completion percentage of 50% and five touchdowns and 10 interceptions. Like, what? How are you an all-star? How? If you're going to pick someone, at least pick Clay Masakiewicz, who had a positive INT, uh, to t- touchdown to INT ratio of five to three. It just doesn't make sense to me. Just don't pick anyone at that point. Come on, man. Zach, who you, I mean, sorry, Neil, who you got? Gab Cousineau, Montreal quarterback. Last play of the game. I know you're going to huck it up for Hail Mary. It's probably not going to work. But it's 11 to 14. You're down by three. You cannot not throw the ball on the last play of the game when you're down. You got to get rid of the ball. Come on, man. And for me, it's Queens, uh, the Queens Gales losing 48 to five after three quarters to the Western Mustangs. Queens is a veteran la- uh, laden team. They had already lost the Western, so they saw what they needed to know. They should have known the adjustments that they had to make. I know they didn't have Giovanni Aprile, but you know Western doesn't have San Vito. Western didn't have Bo Landry. You know a CFL were the. Uh, uh, so linebacker didn't have Sinclair, so you can't really use the injuries as an excuse. This is supposed to be the clash of the top two teams in the OUA, it's supposed to be the cream of the crop in the OUA, the best two coaches. You know, you have veteran team, and they just didn't show up. I mean, they were winning 5-3 early, and then Western put up 43 straight points on them. 43 straight points? This is a Yates Cup matchup. I, I mean, how do you explain that? And then the Gales get their first defensive touchdown in the fourth quarter in garbage time. I, I, I mean, they, they had an outstanding season, 7-1. and one. Uh, They made it to the Yates Cup. Kudos to them. It's great. But then just for that game, though, they just, you know, they didn't get it done. They didn't show up, and it's a shame. Uh, so for me, they're my, come on, man. And just to add on, you said for that game, they just didn't get it done. But when you look at the last game they played against Western, they didn't get it done at all there either. So I think it's just clear that Western was the top dog by far in the OUA this season. Well, there you go. Couldn't have said it any better myself. Uh all right, everyone, uh, that's all we have for you here on the weekly Sports Day CIS Roundup here on Rouge Radio. Make sure to check out sportsday.ca for up-to-the-minute news and opinion on CIS and high school sports. Also, check out rougeradio.com for our latest episodes, as well as CFL Insight heading into the Eastern and Western Finals. We'll be back next week for the national semifinal results and all the news surrounding the Vandy Cup 
in Quebec between Laval and whoever comes out of uh, the Mitchell Bowl. I've been your host, James Katsuris, joined by Zach Miller and Niels Takar. A special thanks to our producer, George Musgrave, and uh, we'll see you guys next time.